Amen. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 is the text. I'm going to invite Brother Tim up here to read. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascend up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but he that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended in is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which also every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeding have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have learned, heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former, com former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be, and be, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let's pray that you will bless the preacher today and give him the utterance and anoint him the Holy Spirit that he can edify us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What I'm speaking on today is Romans Road Revisited. Romans Road Revisited. And as such, uh, hold your place in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go back to where the Romans Road begins. It's Romans 3, verse 23. Pull your place in Ephesians 4, go to Romans 3, 23. Now we understand that the Romans Road is a tried and true and tested and, 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 and great method, especially for new beginners. 
uh, especially for those who tend to get distracted. I would say especially for anyone. It's just, it's just a great way to take the gospel message, throw it into a nutshell, whereby you can follow a script, you can lead somebody to Christ, and then you're not going to get distracted and forget where you are. There's just Generally, the Romans Road is on any good gospel tract, and there's about four steps to it, four things that you need to understand in order to be saved. That's why they call it the Romans Road to Salvation. It's because, first of all, it's always in Romans, and second of all, it's the pathway to salvation. So if you go to Romans chapter 3, it usually begins in verse 23 with an understanding that we are sinners by nature and by choice. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short. Of the glory of God for all have sinned and I always like to tell people are you an L are you an all does, does all give you any wiggle room or is that is that all does, does all mean all um, and contrary to a lot of Calvinistic teachings all in fact does mean all that's everybody all have sinned and come short of the glory of God um, I sometimes will tell you on also verse 10 where it says there is none righteous no not one in other words all have sinned and there's none righteous there, we're, we're all in the middle, stuck, not being good, being super bad, and it just brings us to the bottom, especially in comparison with Christ. And we need to understand that, and this is why we present people as that first step. We are sinners by nature and by choice. Now, that alone doesn't lead anybody to anywhere. That alone just leaves people often discouraged and depressed. Um, that is the most important, single most important of that way of truth ministry and that whatever, Ray Comfort. He just wants to browbeat people and say, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. And he's going to spend 45 minutes convincing people that are sinners. Really, all you have to say, all. Are you an all? Yes, absolutely. Okay, you're a sinner. Let's move on from there with that understanding. You need to understand that, yes, all are sinners. But you also need to understand now that there is a consequence to your sin. And that's where we go to Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. So what you earn by your sins is death. That's what you reap. Essentially, when you sow sin, you receive back to you death. And then we'll often go and we'll explain that that's not just the first death. That's the second death where a soul is cast into the lake of fire throughout all eternity. It's hell as we know it. The best way to conceptually understand a lake that is burning and is on fire. And here's where we spin it. You have a consequence for your sin and that's it condemns you. And then we say this. We receive eternal life as a gift. The second part of that verse says, but, so for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is a gift and it's eternal. And quite often we'll glance over that. That's the contrary. That's the contrast to your sin is that there is a free gift to be received. Now, the next step is quite often this. God loves you, right? And then for that, we turn to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. God loves you, right? We've all heard that. God loves you. God loves you, and that's great. But God commendeth his love or proves his love. It's great if somebody loves you. It's even better if they show it, amen? God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we spent that first little bit of our gospel presentation walking through the Romans road, convincing someone that they're a sinner, but saying that there's a gift that's eternal, and then we quickly come over to Romans 5 or 8 and say, God's proving his love towards you is that because you're a sinner, because you understand you're a sinner, the Christ died for you. While we were yet sinners, if someone says, I'm not a sinner, well then, hey, Christ didn't die for you, I guess. You don't, you don't have access to that free gift because you need to understand that you're a sinner in order to partake of the gift. You need to understand that you can't get there yourself because you're a sinner falling short of the glory of God. So you need to understand that God commends his love towards a sinner, which you have just admitted yourself to be. And the final verse is usually this, Romans 10. Romans 10, we go there. We say, okay, you understand that you're a sinner. You understand that there's a free gift and it's through Jesus Christ. And that he proved his love towards you. And we usually give a synopsis of the gospel. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Perfect life. Descending into hell for three days and three lives. Rising triumphant over sin, death, and hell. In order that he might call it to all and say, whosoever will may come of taking the water of life freely. We'll often throw that in there for free just to get the point across. Um, and then they go to Romans chapter 10, where the Bible says in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And down in verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved. And so that's your that's your gospel presentation in a nutshell. Any good tracks usually got that on there and it gives you a quick step by step by step. Now 
more seasoned soul winners will have other verses that they can go to to, to, uh, to add to these concepts. But if we're to just give the gospel in that clear and simple form, uh, what's missing? Does anyone think anything's missing? Security. That's right. Amen. Eternal security. That's what's missing from this. Now you'll see it very quickly in Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God commanded his love towards you. And quite often we glance over that. It is a very important point. It served as the contrast to the wages of sin that one reaps. But too often we just glance over the gift. We glance over eternal life. And were we to just leave it there... Quite often the gospel presentation comes short of the glory of God. It falls short. Now, it is missing eternal security, or at least a solid proof, a solid stance, a solid push, a solid convincing of eternal security. But does this method just never work? I would say no. I would say that this is popular amongst uh, Jack Howells and who's ever he's taught. This is popular amongst a lot of a lot of believers that we've known, we've grown up with, they will give the gospel in that clear and, and concise manner best they can, and it works. People have gotten saved. But just as often as I believe people have gotten saved, they believed on Christ, uh, they, they, they've understood in that moment the eternal security and what it means, too often I have found sometimes believers that just get mixed up in doctrine because they were never assured of eternal security. But more often, the people that never got the sure grasp, never got the pure doctrine of the eternal security given to them, end up, end up lost because they never understood first that it was a gift and they never understood second that it is eternal, that it lasts forever. And that's the shortcoming. And I, I have met people who, who uh, would actually, um, from, what's his name? Uh, Washout. Uh, Washer, 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 all washer. I, I've met people that would actually fit fit his his charge against us. This this easy believism charge. I believe in easy believism. Amen. It is easy to believe on Christ and be saved and go to heaven. There ain't nothing difficult about that. Christ did all the dirty work. He did all the difficult work. We just simply trust him by faith. But he has this saying he always brings up as he's kind of moping and crying and pretending that he's really sad for souls when the reality is he's not. The reality is, is that that he he's a worker of iniquity, yeah, that's right. because he teaches a false gospel. And the Bible's clear: if you're teaching, propagating, just uh, proclaiming from, let him be cursed, right? Yeah. Yeah. But Paul, watch out! He will take that that phrase that he always excuses and says, "I done did that already." He says he goes far and wide and he finds all these people, especially in the cells, say, "I done did that already." I prayed a prayer. I got saved, and then he'll charge them that they're not doing works and therefore they're not saved. Reality is we don't know whether or not when that man prayed a prayer, when he done did that, when he was just a little kid, we don't know that if he got saved or not. No one's going to look at his works and tell that. But he, his charge is sometimes right, where we will give a Romans Road gospel and it'll be shallow on eternal security, just using that one verse, gift, eternal life, passing over it, maybe throwing in a John 3.16, and, and it doesn't work. Sometimes they just don't receive eternal life. They will pray the prayer. Uh, Catholics will pray the prayer all day long. Um, Hindus, all sorts of people, just add another God to their God shelf. Right? They will pray prayers. But if they don't understand that salvation is a free gift and it lasts for all eternity, they're lost and they're on their way to hell. And then, and then therefore that charge that they will make, the charge that the unbelieving false teachers will make against us, you one, two, three, repeat after me, easy believism, folks. If we're just to follow consistently that Romans road, I think we're guilty. I think we fall short because we don't allow people a full understanding. That's what I had to do in Atlanta. Give a full understanding of what it means to receive a gift and what eternal really means. Because a lot of people don't have a grasp of those two concepts. And without those two concepts, uh, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're saying the wages of sin is death. And then we're just saying, Jesus? Right? We're, we're, no, we're not giving, what does it even mean? What does, is it just a name? Is it, is it, we know it's above every name, the greatest name by which all men will eventually bow down to. But, but what are we giving them if we don't highlight what, the sal what salvation even is? It's a gift and it lasts forever. Right? So we need to be sure that we are punching eternal security 
we're, we're just nailing it every time because people are missing out on salvation because of our shallow gospel presentations. And, and, and the indictment is true. When we, when we are quick, when we're just kind of one, two, three, repeat after me, get to that prayer as fast as we can, and we don't, we don't go around and around and around and make sure that they really understand, we, we often are guilty of this, and we should own that. <clears throat> now, what, what is missing from the Romans Road, I believe, is a, a pure and a true and a clear eternal security teaching. Now, three little points that I want to get hit on today is one, works are not automatic to the believer. So we need to understand that right away because people that will say, that will charge us, they'll, they'll say, they'll say, oh, these, we can turn back to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to use that as our text. Ephesians chapter 4. They'll say, and I want to dispel this, this myth, they'll say, works are automatic. Works must follow. They'll say faith without works is dead. And so if you have, if you say you have faith, but you don't have the works, then, then it's, it's dead faith. It's not living faith. And you know what? Faith without works is dead. That, the Bible says that. It's clear, right? But the context, he's talking to believers when he says faith without works is dead. So he's not saying you're not saved. He's saying you got dead faith. In other words, your faith ain't living. Your faith ain't walking. Your faith ain't doing. Your faith ain't performing. Your faith is dead. Right? Yeah. And we know that, that dead doesn't necessarily mean unconscious, right? Because the dead are there at the judgment, and they're all cast into a conscious hell throughout all eternity. So just because your faith is dead doesn't mean your faith doesn't exist. Faith without works is dead. Amen and amen. If someone wants to bring you to that verse and say, look, faith without works is dead. you got to do works. If you're going to have faith, you're going to believe. You can say, let's go to that verse and I'll expound it to you properly. In context, we're talking to believers. And as we discuss it with believers, we're talking about believers that are, are good for nothing. Why? Because they're not being salt of the earth. They're not doing the works. Right? So I want to dispel that rumor. I want to dispel that myth that that works are automatic with salvation. Now, first of all, when you go to Ephesians 4, the first thing you want to do is go to that very first page, the very first chapter of Ephesians, where it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and then this, to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Who is he writing to? He's writing to the saints. He's writing to the faithful. He's writing to believers, amen. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to the Ephesian church. And he's going to explain to them what he wants to explain to them. And the book of Ephesians is a great book that just enforces Christian living. Enforces living righteously. Enforces. It ends with the armor of God. I mean, we're going to battle, soldiers. We're going to win this war, right? Because we're going to do it in Christ. We're going to raise our standard high. We're Christians, right? We've got the armor. We're ready for war. We're ready for battle. And the Ephesians is talking all about that and uses all sorts of illustrations that people in Ephesus would have understood about what the, what the war is, about what the armor looks like, all sorts of different things that he'll just bring up. But it's predominantly talking about Christian living. And so he, we're not getting away from the fact that Christians ought to live the life. Christians ought to walk what they're talking so let's just see what Paul is saying here to the saints. What Paul is saying here to the faithful. And the first thing he says in verse 1 is, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation which ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. And he continues on. Important thing to note here is that he's talking, remember, to saints. He's talking to the faithful in Christ Jesus, right? Those who are in Christ are those who are born again, children of God, right? And he's saying to them in verse 1 of chapter 4, he's saying, I beseech you. In other words, um, I earnestly request. I, I desire that you would. I want you to. I beseech you. And he's saying this, walk worthy. Now, if works are automatic, if these Christians are to be saved, if they're believers, if they're faithful, and now they're trusting Christ, and now they're born again on your way to heaven, why on earth would the Apostle Paul need to say, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation which you're called. I'm imploring you. I earnestly request that you walk worthy of the vocation. That you walk worthy to be called a saint. That you walk worthy to be called. Why would he need to beg them if they were automatic? Truth is they're not. Truth is that the Christian life is one of growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Growing in grace. Becoming bigger in grace. Growing in faith. Lord, act, give us more faith, the disciples cried out. Right? Yeah. They're perfecting. Look at that in verse uh, 3 through 6. He said, perfecting there. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one 
body, one spirit, even as you are called, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And then he says way down there in verse 12, because he just highlighted there that there is one body. You're all Christians, right? You're all saved. You're all filled with the Spirit. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Are we saying that God is in people now that aren't saved? No, we're saying that these people are saved. Again, we're just going to keep going over this. Saints, faithful, believers, God is in them. And then in verse 12, he says, the reason why they have this congregation, the reason why they have this church, the reason why he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, some evangelists, he gave some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The purpose for these men that led, the purpose for these men that taught, the purpose for the men that did the work of the ministry was for the perfecting of the saints. You notice that they are not already perfect if they need perfecting. You notice that they're not already complete if they need completion. They are to grow. And that's what it says in verse 50. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Grow up, I beseech you, grow up. We are perfecting saints here. This is the business that the Apostle Paul had. This is the business that he gave to those like Timothy and others that he sent out. This is the business that every single man that he sent to preach the gospel, he sent to reach others, he sent to be leaders over these churches, he said, tell them to grow up. He said, perfect these saints. They're saved, they need to grow. That's what it says in verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. He's rebuking them. He's turning it. You haven't learned that yet. You need to grow. There is something that you have not so learned about Christ. And he says this in verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation. There's something you need to put off. What is it? The former conversation. The old man. Now, if the old man was just off, when I got saved, blood-bought child of the king, the old man's gone, I'm a new creature in Christ, all things are new. Why would the Apostle Paul be telling, we got to say it again, saints, faithful. Why would he say, telling people that the Father is above all and dwells in them, why would he be telling them now to put something off? Put off the old conversation. Put off the old works. Put off your old doings. Why would he be charging them that? Why would he be beseeching them? Why would he be earnestly requesting that they put something off? Because it's not natural. Because there is still an old man dwelling in us. And in that man is no good thing. And that ain't going away until we put off, finally, this body. We put off corruptible and erased, incorruptible. Glory to God. Amen. And be renewed. There's another word. Be renewed. In the spirit of your mind. I believe probably right after you get saved, there is a renewal that happens. I remember it just as the Apostle Paul said, that it was like scales came off my eyes. And the world looked different. Yeah. But soon after the world looked different, it looked appealing again. Oh, man. I used to do all those things. I do, and I just kept on living the way I also lived. The, the, it came off. The scales came off. There was a renewing. There was a newing. But now Paul is saying, renew that mind. In other words, get back to that point where you understood the world was, diff world was different. Get back to that point where you understood that without Christ, you can do nothing. Get back to that point where you put your entirety of your faith upon him. Renew your mind in Christ. And when you renew your mind in Christ, you are, you are back to that conversion. Because you, you are dispelling, you are putting off the former conversation. But then he charges this, and that you put on the new man which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. But I'm not going to go back too much, back and forth on the new man, the old man, and that dichotomy and how they work together and how they oppose one another. But you need to understand that Paul is saying here, put off old conversation, put off old man, put off old dead works, and then he's saying put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. It tells me that there is a decision that has to be made. It tells me that these believers, it tells me that those saints, it tells me that those faithful in Christ Jesus, those that have the Father dwelling in them, need to make a decision to put off and put on. Put off the former, put on righteousness, put off the former, walk in the new man, put off the former old man, and choose 
to live after the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. They need to make that decision each and every day. And then there's this big list of let's, if, if we didn't drive this point home enough. We're, we're talking to believers. We're talking to those who are saved. And it's not automatic that they're going to do the right things. Why? Because here now he goes, putting away lying. Let every man speak truth. What just happened there? They put away the old man, lying. And they speak truth with their neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Here it is again. Let him that stole, old man, steal no more. New man, right? The decision was made. Let him that stole, steal no more, right? But rather, let him labor, working with his hands in the thing which is good. And that hate me. Give to him that needeth. Now look at that change. I mean, he went from taking to taking and taking to not stealing to now giving and giving and giving. What a transformation. But he had to decide. And the Apostle Paul had to encourage him. Hey, you used to steal? Steal no more. But rather give. Right? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Corrupt communication breaks down and hurts and destroys and, and Paul, Paul says, hey, choose rather to minister. And then he says this, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. It's, it's essentially what is being described here is, hey, put off the old man. Put off how you used to be lived. Put down how you used to live. That old conversation, that ain't you, but wear that new man. Wear it like a badge of honor. Put that on every day. You used to steal, don't steal, but rather give. You used to, you used to, you used to fornicate, seek a wife, have kids. You used to, you used to smoke and drink and party on the weekends, read your Bible, stay home, help somebody, go soul winning. Right? God is telling you through the Apostle Paul that, hey, Christian, hey believer, hey faithful, hey man in whom I dwell, choose to live right. Why? Because works aren't automatic to the believer. And this is just one chapter in the whole of the Bible that teaches the exact same thing. Hey, if it's automatic, why is the New Testament full of commands? If, if it was just, you're going to live right as soon as you are saved, hey, Christ would have died and it would have been just like, Peace. Enjoy that. Just sit on that. Enjoy it. Hey, you're saved. Wonderful. Nothing wrong is going to ever happen. No, the reality is, is that the commands are in the Old Testament, and the commands just keep getting more stringent in the New. What God says, looking upon a woman to lust after you've committed adultery with her in her heart. I think a lot of men can get away with not committing adultery on their wives. But what happens when you look? Well, Christ elevated the law and brought it to a spiritual level where he says, hey, if you even look with lust, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. I thought, I thought when Jesus came in the New Testament, he was all about grace and he was going to put away the law. And he, no, he did not come to put away the law. He came to fulfill it. And in fact, Amen. in fulfilling it, he raised the bar. Amen. God is much more strict with the believer. Why? Because God, as he says here... The one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, he's in you all. So God empowers you by dwelling within you to do his will, to do righteously. He has given you everything you need, Christian, to live right. You know what you got to do? You got to choose him. You got to put down the old man and walk in the newness of life. You need to put down the old conversation and walk in Christ and put on the new man, and that is a decision that you have to make. That is not automatic, Paul Washout. <laughs> Good works should follow salvation and are commanded. Good works should follow salvation and are commanded. Ephesians chapter 2, we like to go to this verse. We like to go to this verse to highlight grace and faith. And we also use it to highlight the gift side of things. For by grace, Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How many times can he highlight that to you, that salvation is not of works? And a lot of us, a lot of people will believe that. They will say, yes, amen, salvation is not of works. But today, today, many independent, fundamental, King James only, blah, 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 pastors are saying, but they must follow 
Salvation, yes, that's not of works. But works must follow to prove your salvation. Why? Because grace without faith, with faith without works is dead. That's what they'll say, faith without works is dead. And they just keep appealing to that. They'll keep appealing to that. These men got to get their heads out of commentaries and out of books by men and get their faces in the Bible. The Bible is clear. By grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Look how it continues. For we are his workmanship. Whose work? His. That's God. That's our creator. That's Jesus Christ. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And I will say that when you get saved, when you believe on Christ by faith, you should walk in the before ordained good works that God's talking about here. You should Amen. do that. It is in your best interest. It is commanded. It is right. It is what God wants above all things. Is that yes, all men would be saved. But then he said this. My will is that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of Christ. All would be saved and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is hoping that yes, every man woman, child, gets saved. And that is his overarching will for everybody at some point. But he says, good works should follow salvation. He says that here. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto, and there's a direction there, you're created unto, toward good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. So I believe that we should walk in good works. Now here's the illustration. Now, Let's just say, my wife and I created Caleb for the purpose of taking out the garbage. I hate taking out the garbage, especially this time of year. It's cold, you gotta go out at night and risk the coons getting at it, or you gotta go out in the morning and try to rush before you get to work. It's just another thing you gotta do. And then, now where I'm from, you gotta get this little tag that tells you that they'll take it away. You gotta, you gotta put this like 250 tag on every, every bag, and then they'll look at the tag. I ain't taking out the garbage, okay? So we created Caleb unto take out the trash. We created Caleb so that he would take the garbage out so dad didn't have to. Now, God, again, this is the illustration, he created us unto good works that we should walk in them. We created Caleb unto taking out the garbage that he should do that. Now, as soon as Caleb was born, did I lean over him and say, hey, take out the garbage. What are you just laying around for? I created you to take the garbage out. Why aren't you doing your only job? He's <laughs> 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 just gonna sit there crying or you know what I mean? Like what? No, no, right? Caleb is not able. Caleb is not strong enough. There's no physical ability for a baby to do what it was created for, and if that was to take out the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> But then let's say Caleb grows up and now he's got a little bit of muscles on him. You know, he, he, he's, he's able to walk now. He's learned. He's, he's strong enough to get around. He's even running. Wow, look at that kid go. Now the purpose will be fulfilled. I've created him unto taking out the garbage. <clears throat> so do I start at this point saying, come on, Caleb. You got to take that trash out. You got to put it on the road. You got to go to 7-Eleven. You got to get a little tag. You got to put the little tag on there. You got to make sure the lid's closed so that the raccoons don't get it. What aren't you understanding about this? I created you to take out the garbage. Well, he's still not physically able to do that, is he? He may be able to walk. He may have a few motor functions, but he's not able to do that. So what happens then? Okay. I've created him just as God created us to unto good works, which he had before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, now Caleb's able to walk. I've created him to take out the garbage and now he's able to walk. Okay, well what's next? Now he's grown. Okay, now he's strong. He can walk. And now I explain to him with clear understanding, these are the steps that you take to put the garbage on the curb. And I expect you to do that. You, you're, you're, you're 15 years old now. You've had many years to learn to walk. I've told you time and time again how you do this. Now is the time that the should becomes active, okay? Now is the point where I can say, Caleb, I asked you to take out the garbage. You've understood the command. You're physically able to do command. If he says, uh -uh, I'm not doing it. That's disobedience. And now what happens is correction, rebuke, reprove, 
with all long suffering and doctrine. God works the same way in our lives. He created us unto good works. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Whom I love, I rebuke and chasten and scourgeth every son whom I receiveth. God talking about children. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. So here's your, your parallel to the illustration. Somebody done did that and prayed the prayer and they understood eternal security and they grew up unto salvation um, and started to go to church a little bit. They, they understood and got some topics of grace. They understood um, that they're not supposed to lie, cheat, and steal. Okay, now they're grown. Now they're that, that 15-year-old Caleb as a parallel, right? They know what God demands. They're capable of doing what God wants, and yet they refuse. And this is why I say you should follow. Because why? You should follow these works, which should follow salvation because they're commanded, but also because God loves you, he will enforce his rules upon you when you're disobedient. God will correct, God will reprove, God will instruct those who have an understanding of what they're supposed to do and refuse to do it. So this is, this is where we, we, we give people that understanding is, yes, these works are not going to follow, but they should follow. And I've had so many doors I've been at where people are like, I just can't get saved because I don't, I can't quit this. I can't quit that. God has a measure of grace for those people. He's going to work in their lives. He's not going to scream at the baby. He's not going to push the toddler over. He's not going to yell and scream at your face. He's going to let somebody grow in grace. And as he does it, he will bring them to a point where what they should do is what they will do. And they will do it obediently and they will do it by choice. This is why I say good works should follow salvation and are commanded, but they are not automatic. Now, <clears throat> so they're not automatic good works. Um, they should follow salvation, right? And God has this whole program whereby he brings somebody to following uh, the good works. And, and that, that usually takes time. I believe it's different for everybody. He will eventually bring you to the point where you are enabled or he'll just he'll just destroy the disobedient soul. He'll just he'll just take somebody down who who just refuses and they're that stubborn rebellious child, the pictures of the Old Testament, the parents that bring the kid that's drunken and smiting them and they're they're actually put to death in the Old Testament economy. But the next thing I want to talk about is that good works don't keep you. God keeps you saved. Good works will not keep you saved. God will keep you saved. So these works are automatic. These works should follow salvation, yes, but the whole point of this sermon was to discuss how eternal security is missing from the Romans road, at least a thorough understanding of it, unless you go to other proof texts. And I want to highlight the point that while good works don't follow, good works should follow, those good works will never keep you saved. Those good works are simply the obedient, the answer of an obedient heart unto the command of God. Good works don't keep you, God keeps you saved. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 2, Titus 1 verse 2, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now our hope is in the promise of God. And here, that hope is eternal life. Our hope is that, is that we would live forever in eternity. And that's what God promises. But quite often we don't highlight the fact that that hope in eternal life is, is, is being placed that trust, that faith, that hope is being placed on the God that cannot lie and the God that promised. So based on his promise and based on the word of God, we know that he will give us eternal life. Turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 37. Jesus Christ talking. John 6 and verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. This is Jesus talking. He says, I will in no wise cast out those that the Father gives to him. Those that become in Christ because the, the Father led them, drew them, and, and, and they were in Christ. It continues down in verse 39. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. 
And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, right, with eyes to see, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Do you see wavering in God there? Do you see any doubt? He says, not only will I not cast them out, I will not lose them. There is no doubt in Christ's mind. He said, I will raise them up at the last day. Why? Because they believed on him and they have everlasting life. John chapter 10, the Bible says, John chapter 10. So we just learned that Christ will not cast anyone away that comes to him, nor will he lose somebody that comes to him according to the will of the Father. He highlighted that twice. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, the Bible says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So we have this, this double union, this double strength of God, where he says literally, Jesus Christ says, no man can pluck them out of my hands. And that man would include outside men. That man, I believe, would also include the man that is trying to be plucked from his hand. Because that's one of the charges we often hear is that, oh, somebody can't lose their salvation, but they can walk away from it. Okay, okay, well, try that, son. Link arms with somebody and then try to walk away. Okay, it's tough. When somebody gets a hold of your wrist, no matter how hard you try to let go here, they've got you, right? You're pulling, you're pulling, you're trying to re be released from salvation, let's say. They're trying really hard. Maybe they'll even put their foot up on you and they're just trying to, oh, no man can pluck them up. I can walk away from my salvation. Jesus Christ says no man, they, and they can't be plucked out of his hands. And then he says this, my father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So now you have the greatest man of all, the greatest of all, God the Father, holding on to the one that is saved, to the one that is in Christ. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And no man's able to pluck them out of my hand. My Father is greater than all. And no man's able to pluck them out of his hand. Those are those who are saved, those who are born of God. In John chapter 1, the Bible says, John chapter 1, I like to use this illustration. It talks about the relationship of a father and of a son. John chapter 1 says, Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men. So there's, it's not a blood birth, right? It's not, it's not a will of my flesh. It's not the will of some other man in my life wanting to be, me to be born. It's born of God. The Bible here is making the illustration that when you receive Christ, God gives you power to become the sons of God. And the illustration is pretty clear that when Caleb was born, he received power to become the son of Josh. Now, Caleb can grow up and become 18 year old and be like, Dad, I hate you. I, I, I don't love you anymore. I wish I never knew you. I'm changing my name. I'm changing my address. I'm changing my face. I hate you. I'm just going to do every wicked thing I can possibly do to scorn you. And uh, is he still my son? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right? Caleb's actions do not hinder in any way the birth relationship that happens. And those that receive Christ, who are given power to become the sons of God, who is that power? Who is that group given to? It says, even to them that believe on his name, they're born of God. In other words, they are now God's children. They are now God's son. And they can grow up and say, God, I hate you. I'm moving to the other end of the world. I'm not going to serve you. I'm going to do everything wicked I can possibly do just to scorn you. You're not my father. Is he still their son? Yeah. Yes, because you, they were born of God. It didn't change that relationship. That is an eternal, everlasting relationship. Why? Because it's an eternal, everlasting God that promised and then reiterates, none can be cast out, none can be lost. No man can pluck them out of Jesus' hand, and the Father is greater than all, and no man can pluck them out of his hand. Amen. Amen. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a present test, holding on to everlasting life. John chapter 5 and verse 24 says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that 
heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath, there it is again, that present tense, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Is passed from death unto life. They have everlasting life. They shall not come into condemnation, but they have passed from death unto life. They, death has no more dominion over them. And remember, these are all the words of the God that cannot lie. These are all the promises that he promised before the world began. We started off there. The next one I like to go to, John chapter 11 and verse 25. John chapter 11. Verse 25. John 11 and verse 25. The Bible says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever, that's the all there again, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Remember, pass from death into life. Amen. This is good news. This is, this is everything coming full circle. The understanding is clear. They have passed from death into life. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That says there is nothing but life for that person that believeth in him. And Christ is the resurrection. Christ is the life. And I love this. This is a perfect way to, to just end that conversation. Believest thou this? Believest thou this? Because if you don't believe this, if there's any wavering, if there's any misunderstanding after hearing all, all, all of the scriptures set before us, only a strong, carnal self-will can reject these things. Only a strong and carnal self-will, self-motivation. I'm going to get to heaven. My good works will get me to the top. This is the exact same thing we saw in the Tower of Babel. I will build a tower up to heaven. We shall make a name for ourselves. I will live the righteous life. I will do the works. These works will follow and they have nothing to do with me. Only a strong, carnal self-will can reject these truths. Amen. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, it shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this this day? And I'll leave you with that. Believest thou this? The Romans road is missing this eternal security, missing making that thorough. And I believe that there is no wiggle room here in the scriptures. The Bible is clear, hath everlasting life. The Bible is clear, him that cometh to Christ, he will not cast out, neither can he lose them. The Bible is clear that those who come to Christ are within his hand. And no man can pluck him from me, even the man that wants to be plucked from them, if that ever existed. And he says, my father is greater than all, and he's got a hold of me too. They are going nowhere. They are saved. They are blood-bought, child of the king, and they will remain that way forever because they were born of God. Anyone that is born of God is in Christ. Born of God has that relationship eternally existing in heavens, name written down, stamp it, it's sealed unto the day of redemption. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Holy Father, we're confident in this. Lord God, we are, we are assured of our salvation only because... It's in your word and only because you promised it. And Lord, we know that you cannot lie and we know that you would never deceive us into thinking untruths. But there's so many deceivers out there, Lord, who would have us to believe a lie and have us to fall into the condemnation of the devil. I pray and not be so among these people. I pray that anyone, Lord, in needing of that assurance of salvation, not that pride get in the way, Lord, but they would simply seek out one of us today that can help them or even heed the words that were just proclaimed. Eternal security of the believer is important and needs to be inserted in each and every Roman road track that we see. Or better yet, Lord, better yet, we will, we will go with that, that wonderful line of scriptures, Lord, that presents the gospel as plain as we can understand and as plain as we can present it. We would go ourselves and with, with study and with labor, and with a tear in the eye, Lord, we would show people the gaps, the, 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 the truths that are missing, Lord, that, that we could never contain on a simple little gospel tract. I pray, God, that each one of us would become soul winners. We would follow you, right? Because we said, you said, Lord, if we follow you, we'll be made fishers of men. And that's just another promise, Lord, that we believe by faith. We pray, God, that you would work in us, work in this church, work in the lives of each and every one of us, and you would get all the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.